Well, I'd like to uh, welcome all of you here today, and I'd like to welcome you in Melfort. I hope that uh, we're loud and clear. Tara, if you would text me that you can hear me and see me, okay, I'd appreciate that. And uh, Fran, you're looking quite beautiful today. I, I can't see you for real, but I'm sure you are. Um, it's nice that we're giving this a try, and uh, I'm sure happy for all of you in Melfort that you get to go to church at 10 o'clock in the morning instead of 7 o'clock at night. That is going to be quite nice for you. Um, the congregation here in, in Nippon um, uh, will be uh, singing all of the hymns, um, but only four hymns in, in total, uh, or four verses for each hymn in total, um, so that we can stay synced with you, you guys in Melfort. All the rest of you who are watching, I know that many of you from Uganda are watching today uh, live. Um, there are uh, 12 churches in Uganda that are watching us live today. And uh, there's a church in Louisiana, one in Brazil, and then individuals from all over the world who are watching us today. One from Russia, uh, that is in the Russian Urals, is watching us live today. They are English-speaking people who work there, and uh, they wanted to um, watch an English service. And for some reason, they have picked us. So, so here we are. Um, and Lyle just said, God bless us. Lyle, why aren't you in church? <laughs> Anyways, Lyle's at home for some reason. <laughs> Anyhow, um, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm a bit nervous today. Um, Tara still hasn't texted me. I hope this is working. Okay, maybe she'll turn this off. There. Okay, we're good. Today is the third Sunday after Pentecost. And just a few other announcements before we begin. Um, we will only be having communion once per month uh, because of the really long nature of doing it the way we are doing it. And last Sunday it took a long time and I was um, about 20 minutes later than normal. So but we will be doing it just once a month for a while until, this, un until we get word that we can start doing things as, as we have been. Um, there is word, uh, and I don't know how truthful it is, I don't want to start gossip, uh, but I've been told by the church, by some church officials, that they have been told that we will be moving to the next phase soon if there isn't a, a big backlash moving to this phase. So if we're all still careful, if our people stay cautious and uh, then we will be moving to the next phase. And that means, that phase will mean singing without masks and uh, being able to have regular Holy Communion. Um, so that's, that's where we're at. I've been reading and watching an awful lot. The vaccine is going much better than they anticipated. And uh, now they're saying that there could be vaccine as early as late October or middle of November. Um, I don't believe that. But at least they're, they're saying that the vaccine they've produced is doing amazingly well, producing a wide range of antibiotics or of antibodies to attack this thing. And if they can get that, I'm sure the people over 80 will get it first. And cancer people uh, will get it first, uh, children, young children. 
and then the rest of us will 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 uh, be given that vaccine, and then maybe our our life will go back to normal. I I don't know whether we'll ever go back to the way it was, but I hope there'll be something of that. Still, and I think that's that's about it. The prayer list is printed there. If you have prayer concerns, please get them to me so that I can include your names in the prayer list. And uh, that's about it. So we will begin our worship service today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd ask you all to please rise as we join together in the brief order for confession and forgiveness in your bulletins. On the other end, and Melfort, either Larry or Tara will be leading the part um, or helping the congregation to do their part. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say that we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There are many things we have said and done this past week that we wish we could take back, but we can't. So we ask God to forgive those same sins. Let's just take a few moments to consider that now and ask the Lord for forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Let us all sing together our opening hymn, God Himself is Present, number 907.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Please turn to your neighbor and wave at them. Peace be with you. <laughs> Uh, you can tell the, the ones that are more royal, the, the more royal wave. <laughs> okay, please, please be seated. Let's join together in the prayer of the day. It's found in your celebration sheets, and I'm sorry, Melfort, I will get these sheets to you this week, and then you'll have these to follow along. Let us pray. O oh God, because your abiding presence always goes with us, keep us aware of your daily mercies, that we may live secure and content in your eternal love. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. On your wondrous works I will meditate, and I will declare your greatness. And from Psalm 56, For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God whose word I pray, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Let us together. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. We'll now have our readings, first reading from Jeremiah, and our second reading from Romans. The Old Testament reading for the third Sunday of Pentecost is from Jeremiah chapter 20. O Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You are stronger than I, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all the day. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I cry out, I shout, violence and destruction, for the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and a derision all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart as it were a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot, for I hear many whispering. Terror is on every side. Denounce him. Let us denounce him, say all my close friends watching for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived. Then we can overcome him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me as a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord, Lord of hosts, you, uh, who tests the righteous, who sees the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them, for to you have I committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hand of evildoers. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from Romans chapter 6. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but pre present yourselves to God as those who have been bought from death to life, 
and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, who were once slaves to sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Audrey. The gospel today is from Matthew 10, 5 to, and 21 through 33. I'd ask you all to please rise. These 12 Jesus sent out instructing them, brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father, his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have not, no fear of them, for nothing is covered that, you will not, that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, for you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Here ends the gospel. Uh, you may be seated and we will sing our next hymn. My hope is built on nothing less, hymn number 576 in the Lutheran service book. 576, my hope is built on nothing less. Those of you at home, uh, if you want to find that hymn, just in, in any hymnal, it's a pretty common one. I'll give you just a moment for you to dig up a hymnal and uh, follow us. My hope is built on nothing less. In the Lutheran service book, it's number 576.
My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. No merit of my own I claim, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant and blood support me in the raging flood. When every earthly prop gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Last verse. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, clothed in his righteousness alone, redeemed to stand before his throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Valerie uh, suggested that I stay away from always telling you that I'm telling a story today that you've heard before, and she's probably right that I shouldn't be doing that all the time, but I'm going to anyhow. <laughs> I, uh, I'm going to be telling a story today that I have told you on many occasions. And I tell this story because it, it just meant so much to me, and I think it's healing to tell it again and again. Um, and for today, it fits so very well into the message. Imagine a large crowd following Jesus as he approaches the little town of Nain in Israel. Imagine the dry ground similar to that of Arizona, a look like that. Uh, even the fields of the day, there was nothing in the way of irrigation as there is today in Israel, and so the, the ground was pretty much dry, and there was, uh, you know, the color was pretty much brown everywhere. <laughs> and there's this large group headed behind Jesus, his disciples, and the people that supported the disciples, and perhaps family members of the disciples. It, it probably was a large crowd. But at the same time, a large funeral procession is leaving Nain, headed for the cemetery. Now, in our culture today, and sadly, I don't see it like I used to, but in our culture today, if you're driving along and you see a funeral procession, you're supposed to pull over and wait. But we're all in such a hurry nowadays, people will, I've even seen people barge into the line and pass the cars and even honk at them for driving so slow. 
Now we're supposed to, as I said, pull over and wait. But in Jewish tradition, it was very different. If you came upon uh, a funeral group headed out to a cemetery, you were, and you intersected that group, you were supposed to join the group. You weren't supposed to wait for it or pass it by. You were supposed to get in line and follow it. And so we have these two groups that are intersecting. And this is the first of three people, this story, where Jesus will raise a person from the dead. In the raising of Jairus' daughter, Jesus, uh, she had just died. This guy was on the way to the grave when Jesus brought him back to life. And we don't know how long he had been dead. Not long, probably. Maybe a day, maybe two at the most. And of course, then there is Lazarus, um, who was dead four days when he was raised to life. And it doesn't matter to God how long they've been dead. He can bring back all the sailors who were buried at sea. Uh, he can put back together the bodies that have been hurt or destroyed in accidents. He, he can rebuild a person from ashes. God can do whatever God chooses to do, including raising a young boy from the dead. Now, the city Nain is located about 10 miles southeast of Nazareth, just south of Mount Tabor. And it's about a day's journey southwest of Capernaum, where he had healed the centurion's servant. Archaeologists have found a burial site about 10 miles away. Now, we don't know if that's where they were headed, but if they were, it makes sense that that's where these two groups of people intersected. Now, Jesus' procession obviously was filled with joy and excitement. And there was all sorts of hope for the future. And They had seen miracles, and there was all sorts of happy talking and discussion, and, uh, discussion and, and, and love being shown amongst the people. But then they intersect with this other group that was weeping and perhaps wailing with sadness. Undoubtedly so. Because a young man, an only son, had died. One more point. Jesus was not big on rules. Jesus was more about people than about the rules. Touching a corpse caused defilement, made you unclean, and to do so was absolutely forbidden. Jesus could have been defiled, but instead, Scripture says he had compassion. That's two Sundays in a row we're talking about Jesus with compassion. And he goes over and he touches the bear or he touches the child the word translated touch is a strong word in the Greek, meaning to lay hold. He laid hold. Perhaps it indicates that he grabbed hold of the, the bear and firmly stopped the procession. And then he commanded. He speaks and it happens. Even the dead hear Jesus' voice. Luke 7, 11 reads, Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the town gate, a boy who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, who was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched, remember, laid hold of the bear. And those who carried it stood still. And Jesus said, young man, 
I say to you, get up. And the young man sat up and began to speak. You could imagine what his first words were as he sat up. Mom, what's happening? Why am I up here on this? What, what happened? And of course, the people then, as Scripture says, so the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Fear seized them all. And they began to glorify God, saying, A great prophet has appeared among us, and God has come to help his people. It seems like forever ago now, but I was part of an Easter play I've told you about on numerous occasions called King of Kings. And over the years that we did it, we literally performed to thousands of people. And there were two scenes in that play that I simply could not watch. If I watched them, I took the chance that I would not be able to sing afterwards because they shook me up so much. The one that was the worst was the action, the acting of this story. Valerie actually was part of that scene, and she was one of the mourners sometimes, following behind the bear. And a young, young man would lay on the bear, and the person who was acting as Jesus would come over and take hold of the bear and stop the procession and motion that the boy should sit up, and he did. And the mother would grab hold of the young man, and she would just shake with tears and joy and excitement. It, it was so moving. I had to look away. Because as I said, I, I, I would just, I would start weeping and I couldn't stop. There is the funeral procession. We have the bear, which is the stretcher for the body, just a flat set of boards, maybe with a few handles attached somehow. We have the bearers of that bear, maybe five, six men, seven, eight men. And we have the large crowd of accompanying mourners dressed in black cover, perhaps. And we have the body being carried outside of the city, wrapped in cloths of some sort. Linens, fine linens, were for the rich. These were probably very inexpensive cloths. Burials were prohibited inside city walls. And the dead had to be removed from the city quickly. But in this story, which only includes one body in the bear, there are actually two people who are dead. There is not just a funeral for a man, but the mother of this son is also virtually dead. For her, this is also a funeral because she was a widow and losing her only son meant she was in a lot of trouble. On the day her only son died, she died with him. In fact, per the custom of the day, the bereaved mother walks just in front of the bear. She leads the funeral procession toward the final resting place of death and grave. And ironically, this is her procession as well, and, and not just her own son's. She knows the direction of death because she herself looks to the future and sees the incredible hardships that await her. Now we hear a lot about motherless children, and there is always grief and sadness when a child buries a parent, but how often... Do we talk about childless mothers? I've seen it far too many times. I've been told that some pastors go their whole ministries without ever having had a funeral for a child. I've had 17. Some were horrible accidents. Some because of sickness. And others were because of stupid mistakes. It seems like a tragic reversal, one of life's 
foulest acts when a child precedes a parent in death and the parent has to bury their own child and see them travel from the womb to the tomb. And the pain. And sadly, I've pastored three families whose children took their own lives. The pain is unbelievable. It's unbelievable to witness. I can't imagine what they're feeling. Those marriages, the mums and the dads, almost always fail. Did you know that? That when a child dies, there is, I think, like an 80% chance that the marriage will fail. So great is the stress and the pressure it puts on a couple. Well, back to our story. This mother leads the procession to her son's resting place. And she has to bury the one who came from her body, the little boy she'd watched and played with and loved so very much. She's a widow, and so this is double jeopardy. From now on, she would be dependent on charity. Deuteronomy 26 talks about that. Because her economic well-being was dependent on the men in her life, and now they were gone. Now her only son. You can be breathing, but still be dead. It happened this way. I was sitting at home watching television when the phone rang. It was 4.30 on a Sunday afternoon. And I was told to come quickly to Benalto to the rodeo arena. I was told that there had been a terrible accident. And an eight-year-old young boy by the name of Braden had been killed in a rodeo accident. I phoned one of my closest parishioners, a lady who also knew the family well, but a lady who I knew had tremendous gifts in prayer. And I brought Valerie along as well, also gifted. And there I, along with one of my parishioners and Valerie, found the father and mother in the most agonizing pain I've ever seen. Their boy had been suddenly killed in a rodeo accident, a junior rodeo, riding little heifers. Braden was wearing a flak jacket and a helmet, protective gloves and even a face mask. But somehow that little heifer's hoof got through the protection and damaged the boy's spleen and he died right there on the arena floor. First responders came. They did their best. He was taken to the funeral home in Sylvan Lake before his mother even arrived at the arena. And so there she sat holding to her husband a look of loss unparalleled. I prayed with her. Valerie and, and the other lady stayed and prayed with her and held her. And I headed to the funeral home because I wanted to make sure that Braden was prepared for his mother's arrival. And when I got there, I was told that the officials had not yet signed off on the body, so the funeral home could not bring Braden out yet. I excitedly, in a very frustrated manner, reminded them that the boy's mother was about to arrive, but again they argued, they couldn't do anything. Well, I was under no such rule, so I went in the back, took the little guy, cared for him, washed him, laid him on an old bedspread that was laid over a gurney. We covered the gurney, put him there in the center of it. They had a little pillow. We rolled it out. I lit a candle next to the little guy, and then they arrived. For the next two hours, I watched the most agonizing suffering. 
I should think that the story today that we have read would have mirrored what I saw. This woman lost her little boy. She would have never been the same. On that huge day, a part of her died. And all the love and care of her families and friends, all the talking and the counseling, and all the prayer of that moment could not bring that little boy back. So they thought. But one can be breathing and still be dead. The son is dead, the mother too, and this is really a family funeral. But Jesus is not a fan of funerals. He attends this funeral to stop it, to destroy death. Scripture says he had compassion. He looked at this woman and he saw right into her heart. He could feel her pain, her agony. Scripture says that when he saw his dear friend who had died, that he wept. Maybe on this occasion, maybe again he wept. I, I don't know. Scripture doesn't say so. But Jesus boldly goes over and stops the whole procession. Sit up. Rise. Rise up. It's interesting that People knew who he was. They knew what he was capable of. Yet no one, according to Scripture, ran over and said, come quickly and, and raise this young boy to life. There's no prayer request for resurrection. There's no mention of faith involved here. Jesus doesn't say, because of your faith, I have raised you from the dead. None of those things. It seems that he did this for one reason alone. Love, mercy, compassion. The Lord's heart broke. And he took the initiative because he hates death. He hates the pain that death brings with it. this generous act of mercy and grace. Not a merit-based system of healing. Martin Luther preached, Thou art a gracious God. Thou dost good also to them who even deserve it not. Jesus knows the need there is the recognition in the words of the Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria. One should, he said, be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a great battle. One may be breathing but still be dead. One may be an empty shell housing a deep void. Are you alive today? Jesus has compassion on you, too. He sees into your hearts, and he loves you. Jesus is even more than kind, for when the Lord saw the widow, he had compassion upon her, and he has a deep, visceral response. He's moved by the presence of death, embodied by this woman, the same compassion the Good Samaritan has for the man robbed, stripped, and beaten, the same compassion the father has for the prodigal son. In all of these cases, compassion for the one in need is the impetus for action. This mother and widow leading her own funeral is like the one lying on the road, beat up and left to die, or like the one lost in need of being found. She has a body but it's clear that she is dead. The compassion of God will not allow it. 
So Jesus touches the bear, touches the death, transforms it into life. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. Scripture doesn't tell us what the mother said. She never says, Alleluia, or thank you, Jesus, or praise the Lord. We don't know what she said, if she said anything at all. I'm sure she was so shocked by the moment and so taken by the fact that her boy had been returned to her. Well, Scripture says that fear fell upon them all. And they began to praise God. Now why God chooses some and not others, I don't know. That day in the back room as I washed that little boy, I prayed like I have never prayed before. And I believed that if God willed it, that little boy could sit up right there before me. I believe that today, too. I believe that if God so chooses, the dead will rise. And when I prayed for that little boy to sit up, Tears began to flow, and I, I begged God to give him life. I can't know the mind of God, so I have to trust the heart of God, because that I know full well. Jesus gave the boy to his mother. The death she died because of her son's death was demolished. In giving her only son back to her, Jesus gave her back her life too. He resurrects her and the boy. Her dreams for the future suddenly restored. What she had lost was found. A relationship she thought that would never be resurrected came back to life. Her her blind eyes opened, her lame legs given life. And all it takes is one touch from the compassionate Lord. God wants you to live your life with abundance and excitement and joy. And just when you perhaps thought your life was over, just when you've made your own funeral arrangements in your life, that things are at an end, Jesus has one more compassionate move, one more loving word for you, and it is rise, rise up. Rise up to hope again. To realize your forgiveness. To realize your place as a child of God. And so I end today with that word, rise. This isn't false hope. It's not false hope in the face of reality. It is as God has promised that one day the dead will rise. Amen. Let us sing our next hymn. And uh, our next hymn, uh, Today is Take My Life and Let It Be, number 784 in the Lutheran Service Book. Number 784 in the Lutheran Service Book, and we'll just give a second for the Melfort Church and for anyone else who needs to find the hymn in your hymnals. 
Uh, please look that up now. Take my life and let it be. Hymn number 784. Number 784 in the Lutheran service book. Take my life and let it be. Take my life and let it be Consecrated, Lord, to Thee Take my moments and my days Let them flow in ceaseless praise Let them flow in ceaseless praise Take my hands and let them move At the impulse of thy love Take my feet and let them be Swift and beautiful for thee Swift and beautiful for thee Take my voice and let me sing Always only for my King Take my lips and let them be Filled with messages from Thee Filled with messages from Thee Verse 6 Take my love, my Lord, I pour At thy feet its treasure store Take myself and I will be Ever only all for thee Ever only all for thee The Apostles' Creed is found in your bulletins. And again, we'll just take a few moments for Melfort to uh, join us again. The Apostles' Creed, and I'd ask you all to please rise as we confess our faith together by these words. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I want to um, add a name to the list of prayers today. A young lady from Porcupine Plain who is a member of the church in Mistatum. Her name is Farah. And she's, uh, I don't know, how old would Farah be? Is she six? Five maybe? She... Uh, She'd want me to say she's older, maybe. Maybe she's eight. <laughs> um, Farah has fought cancer on a few occasions, and she has had victory over it and is doing much, much better. And she has a tremendous family behind her, the Lutz family, and her, her family, her mom and dad, and their, their people, and 
the Mustatum Church has spent a great deal of time in prayer for her, and I wanted to mention her today. She's very special, and she, I hope, is watching today. Her mom, Blair, um, said that she would be watching. So, Farrah, we're going to be praying for you today. So the other people we are praying for are on the prayer list, and when we come to that place, I will be pointing to those. But let us pray. Now, I will be praying the prayers today because um, the, the people in, out there cannot hear you praying. So um, if you just follow along today. Merciful Father, hear your people as they pray in the name of Jesus on behalf of all manner and conditions of people. We remember today, Pharaoh, and we thank you, Lord, that she was able to get well and that she will live a happy and joyful and healthy life. We give thanks, Lord, for that miracle, for the doctors and nurses who did such a great job, and for all of her people, her family, who care for her. Lord, in your mercy. Faithful God, when we are fearful of our enemies and weary of the struggle, you have been our shield and our strength. Grant to us the full measure of your grace to sustain us against all who are against us and help us to endure the trials and temptations of this mortal life and be faithful unto death. Lord, in your mercy. Faithful God, with your favor upon us, we pray you to help us in our fight against temptation and sin. Help us to live holy and righteous lives by the power of your Spirit and keep us from surrendering ourselves to the slavery from which Christ has set us free. Lord, in your mercy. Faithful God, with the witness of the saints before us and the courage of your Holy Spirit within us, we pray you to help us to maintain the faithful confession and to contend for the faith in our own age, as did those who confessed Christ at Augsburg. Give to all the churches of the Augsburg Confession unity of doctrine and harmony of life together under the cross of Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Faithful God, give grace to those being baptized, to the catechumens in their instruction, and to all the places where your people gather to learn your word. Equip us to live out the promise of our baptismal life under your grace and guide us to love our neighbors as you have loved us. Lord, in your mercy. Faithful God, give healing and strength to the sick, to all afflicted in body and mind, and grant to those who struggle the gift of peace of mind and heart. Hear us especially for those who have requested our prayers, and we include today young Farah. We include Eric, Nancy Knudsen, Rod, myself, Jeanette, Pastor Peter and Laurel, who are attending worship today in their first call, that you will bless their ministry, for George Campbell, for Doug Smith, for Lottie and for Linda, for Elsie, for Kim, for Hilma, and Dean. A special prayer for Kakir as he cares for the orphanage. He helps with 350 children. We pray for all those children and the orphanage that help will emerge here in this land to give him a hand to feed those children and clothe them. We also pray and ask a special blessing for the church in Uganda, for the Lutheran church in Bangladesh, for the Lutheran church in Russia, and for the Lutheran church in Ethiopia. 
May the Lord bless and keep all of you. Heavenly Father, we also remember today those many people who are watching online, that you would bless them. And if their heart is broken, we pray, Lord, that you would have compassion upon them, that you'd remind them that they are not alone, that they're loved, and that we're praying for them today. Lord, in your mercy, Faithful God, by your word and table, you continue to feed and nourish your people with all that will sustain our lives and faith. Help us to receive this give, these gifts with faith and with repentance. Bring us to that day when all earthly divisions will cease, and united in faith we shall be one people before your altar, Lord, in your mercy. For all these things, Father, and everything else for which we need, we pray you to grant us for the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died and rose and lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please rise for the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. There will be no offering today um, because the, uh, the, well, we can't hand a plate around because of the virus. So the, the offering plate is at the back, and if you would please put uh, your money in the plate as you leave, um, that'd be terrific. Those of you online, if you would like to send an offering to our church, uh, it is box 188, Nipawin, Saskatchewan, Canada, S-O-E-1-E-O. If you'd like to send an offering, please do so. And attention, Karen Tran. Attention, Karen Tran, T-R-A-N-N. Box 188, Nippon, Saskatchewan, S-O-E-1-E-O. And with that, let us uh, sing the doxology and then the benediction. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us sing our last hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, number 549. 549. Uh, and we will sing verse 1, 2, 3, 7. 1, 2, 3, and 7. Um, folks, I'm a bit late today, and my window's a little shorter now between here and Mistatum, so I am going to leave right away. Uh, but number 541, 1, 2, 3, and 7. And so to all of you, may the Lord bless you and keep you and love you lots, and we'll see you tomorrow at 11 o'clock for the next live feed. I'll say so long. God bless. Bye-bye.